Welcome to New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. What works to help people build lives outside of jail and prison? I mean, other than not sending them there in the first place. One answer has been proven again and again. Education works. You can see evidence of that right now in the remarkable documentary College Behind Bars on uh, PBS. That's about the Bard Prison Initiative. You can also hear it in the words of Stanley Richards. This is from a live episode about Rikers Island that we recorded in March 2019. Richards spent time on Rikers and in state prison where he enrolled in college classes. He's now the executive vice president of the Fortune Society. One of the elements I know for me that helped me change my life was education. What I thought all my life I was going to be cycling in and out of prison because I thought that's what my destiny, that was my life. And then when I realized through education that all those messages I got about my worth and all those messages I got about, I got about who I was because I come from the projects were lies. To talk about education behind bars, we have a couple of guests on today's show. The first I'll introduce you to is Jarrell Daniels. Beginning at age 18, he spent six years incarcerated. And here he is in a clip from a TED Talk explaining a transformative experience he had near the end of his sentence. Imagine with me for a second, a future where no one can become a prosecutor, a judge, a cop, or even a parole officer without first sitting in a classroom to learn from and connect with the very people whose lives will be in their hands. That future Jarrell is describing actually happened. It was an experiment in learning behind bars that set him on his current path as a sophomore at Columbia. More than just a college seminar in prison, the class brought together prosecutors from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and a group of incarcerated men. The goal was to study the criminal justice system together, and along with readings and discussion, produce a set of policy proposals to present to the DA and other officials. The class, called Inside Criminal Justice, is now in its fourth semester and has expanded to other facilities and to other district attorney's offices. The class was the brainchild of Lucy Lang, at the time an assistant district attorney in Manhattan and now the executive director of the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution at John Jay College. Jarrell was in the first class Lucy helped teach, and I recently sat down with both of them to talk about the experience. I started by asking Jarrell to describe how the class was greeted inside the prison. During the orientation, it was tense. A lot of the men, you know, they were like, how, you know, basically, like, how dare you come in here and try to, you know, access about, you know, criminal justice reform, and you put us in here, and, you know, those, those kind of comments. And, you know, Lucy sat there poised, and she was like, I understand, you know, your challenges, but this is our opportunity to make a difference. This is our opportunity to work across whatever kind of differences we may have to, to um, towards a solution towards some of the challenges that you face in your community and some of the challenges within our own agency. Um, and, you know, I was sold from, you know, from them even stepping foot inside the prison. It, the simple fact that a prosecutor wanted to come inside of a facility to see what some of the conditions were like was enough for me to say, you know, whatever they're going to do, I want to be a part of it moving forward. So I would say, like, the first day of the classroom was, and I assumed it would be mostly white, Caucasian people in the room, whether male or female. Um, and I was actually surprised to see, you know, there were black, Hispanic, um, different ethnicity prosecutors in the room. Um, and it wasn't, you know, like a kind of standoffish environment. Like, we weren't sitting across from one another, they on one side, us on the other side. Um, and that was, that was helpful for me, to, you know, to see that, you know, they weren't scared of us. They weren't there to, you know, just talk to us or talk at us, but it was more of a conversation, and we were included in that conversation. And you signed up for this class, right? This was a voluntary yes. experience. Yeah. What, what what do you think led you to signing up for it in the first place? That's a good question. So I always, like, my simplest answer is that, you know, I saw power, and then I saw powerful in two names. Um, the first name was Columbia University. Um, and the second name was the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Uh, so my case was prosecuted in the Office of Special Narcotics, which has residency inside of the Manhattan DA's office. Uh, so I saw this as an opportunity for me to kind of redeem myself to society and kind of prove to the district attorneys in the room and also who represented the Manhattan DA's office that I wasn't this person whose life was discarded. 
um, as if it was meaningless and had no potential, but more of, of a person who can be in the room with people, um, not just holding my experiences, but also offering solutions to some of the challenges so that we can work together to fix our communities. Because at the end of the day, even though I am somebody who's formerly incarcerated, I don't want to live in a community with, with gun and gang violence in it, and I wouldn't want anybody else to as well. And then, Lucy, what led to the uh, idea for this class? And it's kind of a unique model where you're not just teaching a, a college class in a correctional facility, but you're also bringing together prosecutors and people who are incarcerated in, in one room. I had been a prosecutor for more than a decade when I started to realize how detached I had become from the consequences of my decision making. One example stands out in particular, which is that at the conclusion of a very lengthy homicide trial in which uh, two young men killed another young man, I called the mother of the man who'd been killed the following morning and said, how do you feel? And she said, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed. But when I woke up this morning, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys. And I really thought then, if she's able to think this way, why am I not? And what I wanted to do was to find a way to encourage the culture of the district attorney's office to include the experiences of everyone who touches the system, not just the victims and witnesses with whom prosecutors are rightly always concerned, but also people who are charged with crimes. So I did kind of a landscape analysis to see what was out there and learned that really there weren't any programs for prosecutors or other criminal justice system actors to repeatedly go inside of prisons and get to know people on the inside. So I uh, coincidentally was reading an article about the Columbia Center for Justice and saw the name Professor Geraldine Downey, who is the director there. And I cold called her and said, I have this crazy idea. Can we explore it? And she said, yes. And then I started looking for the right correctional partner. And there are only a limited number of state prison facilities in New York City. And it happens that the leadership at Queensborough Correctional Facility, which is the state's reentry facility in Long Island City. So that's for people at the end of their sentences, right. often long sentences. That's right. right. It's where many people, in particular from New York City, come through on their way home from lengthy sentences. And it happens that the leadership of Queensboro is really creative and thoughtful and committed to programming. So myself and a colleague from the DA's office and Professor Downey went in and met with, as Jarrell described, a group of men from the facility, some of whom had been intentionally invited by the leadership. There were also people in the room who had never had any interest in talking to a district attorney, uh, didn't have any college background, and were just thrown into the mix. And so we presented it, and we heard people out, and encouraged people to let the superintendent know if they were interested in participating. And I'm so fortunate that not only did Jarrell volunteer to participate, I've since learned that he became an advocate on the inside, encouraging people to take advantage of the opportunity and see what it was we were trying to do. What I've did on the inside with the men is like, do you want to be a part of history? Like, this is your opportunity to be in a position where you can actually make change. It's one thing to go out and advocate and protest and, you know, have all of these critiques of the system. But it's another thing to be in a position to make the actual change you would like to see, not just for yourself, but for other people who are having these kind of interactions with the justice system. So it, it didn't really take much convincing, but it was just kind of like a reassurance for them. Like, this is this is something that your family is going to be forever proud of you for. This is something that, you know, whoever is impacted by a policy change is going to forever be grateful to whoever was a part of that conversation that led to this policy development and implementation. It's interesting to think about it as historic. I appreciate Jarrell talking about it that way. But in some ways, once we started doing it, it was totally obvious that it would work. And it's been interesting to see the reception at other district attorney's offices as we have both been traveling around and advocating for this new model of legal education for prosecutors in partnership with local universities. There is a real hunger for this kind of community engagement amongst prosecutors. And invariably, people say, why don't you include defense attorneys? Why don't you include judges? Why don't you include parole boards? And of course, all of these are criminal justice system actors who might benefit from the kind of community building that we're seeking to do through the very basic liberal arts college education model. Well, so a, a question for either one of you, I guess. What, what made it so obvious that it was going to work? 
We often in American society rely on trainings and seminars and forums to educate people on how to best be prepared for a job. Um, if we think about the military, we think about the training, the extensive training that they go through, and they're still not prepared for war. Nothing prepares you until you're actually in combat. But relating this to the Inside Criminal Justice Program, we're asking district attorneys to go through some of my years of law school, um, some who've already had you know undergraduate degrees before going into law school. You know, we're saying that you're now qualified because a degree made you qualified to make these decisions around human lives. But they're really not really prepared as best as we would hope for them to be to have that kind of power over somebody's life. Um, but from this inside criminal To appreciate justice, just how powerful that power is. Exactly. Really. And, I, and, and I think, you know, paraphrasing some of the words uh, of one of the district attorneys, he said this was the most meaningful education experience I've ever had. Um, learning from the very people whose lives was in his hands for years. What are we doing to prepare these individuals for life after incarceration? And on the front end, what are we doing to hopefully prevent some of the challenges that lead to them committing crimes in the first place? The system is structured in a way that all the system actors can separate themselves from the end result. And traditionally, prosecutors closed a case as soon as someone was sentenced. So there was no looking back, and that's by design within the system. Well, no no looking forward either to post-conviction. That's right. And and it's part of what's very uh, inspiring about this moment in criminal justice, that prosecutors are starting to think about their obligation to reentry. They're thinking about their mandate as supporters of public safety being not just detaining people for a period of time so that they can't commit crimes in the public during that time, but also bearing in mind that folks are almost invariably coming home and we want them to come home better off and not likely to enter the system again. And so, Jarrell, what is it like doing a college course behind bars? So I was in a medium security prison, so there's no there's no cells. There's um, just what they call dormitory units. This is a Queensboro at the reentry. Yes, facility. it's Queensboro, and also the one I was in prior to Queensboro. Um, and they're all dormitory settings, so it's is no locking in a cell, privacy, quiet time, lights going off. There's a count at different points throughout the day where you have to go back to your bed area. Um, the bed area is where you would try to do some studying, but again, there's no privacy. There's people walking back and forth past your bed. There's people talking who might be a few beds down from you. Um, you can hear them talk and they may be up late at night talking or having conversations, laughing and joking, and nothing you can really do but try to, you know, block out the noise and kind of focus in on the study. Um, I've seen people go inside of the bathroom and take their their books inside of the stall and study inside of the stall where, you know, to seclude themselves. I've seen people go in the shower area, close the door um, and try to seclude themselves. I've seen people even go as far as the slop sink area, which is like a, a janitor's closet, and close themselves in there just to study with the lamp that you can plug into the wall. I think that, you know, you should never have to go that, to that extreme to try to, you know, focus on putting yourself in a better position for your own release. But I think that it's a necessary step that people are willing to take because they know that, you know, if I don't plan for my release right now, I know that the system is not set up to plan for my release. And I know that if I, you know, if I depend on that $40 in the Metro card and the push for parole to maintain employment, that it's not going to be enough because they don't really actually set me up to lead a healthy and productive life um, with all of the restrictions that come with post-release supervision. Notwithstanding the abysmal study conditions, almost categorically, the incarcerated students were better prepared for class than the prosecutor students. <laughs> right. I, you know, that kem- comes up, too, in this College Behind uh, Bars documentary. Mm-hmm. Same thing, that uh, the incarcerated students are just, were actually better prepared than the students at uh, Bard College. Professors mm-hmm. were saying, you know, I can't use the multimedia stuff and tricks I can use in the college because I'm in a prison facility, but I don't need them because these students are just so engaged and so prepared. Yeah. yeah. And I think the reading materials is like, it's interesting and I say interesting because you're dealing with what they consider a non-traditional student. So students who've had gaps in their educational journey for some time, but then now the the curiosity has been spiked and they want to learn something different than, as opposed to, you know, life inside of an impoverished community. We know that all too well. And I think, you know, when I was presented, like, just to give you an example, one of the readings in inside criminal justice course was um, Judge Underhill, and he wrote, um, did the, the name of the article was, did the man I sent this to 18 years deserve it? Um, and in that op-ed, he talked about how, you know, him as a, as a I believe he was a federal judge. 
he talked about how he couldn't he was losing sleep um he said this 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 case just stood out to him and he said he, he was losing so much sleep that he actually went to the prison after a few years after this person was convicted and went to go see how he was doing and just as his um intuition had was telling him this person had changed their life um despite of the long sentence that he gave him and he realized that there was nothing that he could do or that person could do to get him out before his 18 year mark I mean, he said that, you know, that's what led him to start thinking differently about his job as a judge. And, you know, is he fully taking into consideration this person's potential to change and evolve into a different person as opposed to the person they were when they committed that crime to begin with? Yeah, I had a look at the most recent syllabus for the course. And you guys are, I mean, there's some really interesting reading on there. There's Michelle Alexander. There's John Pfaff. There's uh, who both have views that are pretty critical of prosecutors. There's Viktor Frankl on his uh, experience in a concentration camp. Uh, you're dealing with some pretty heavy themes, restorative justice, uh, trauma, the roots of mass incarceration. You know, how does it work presenting these readings and these themes to what is could be in some ways a kind of divided audience of, of prosecutors and, and people who are currently incarcerated? How, how do we present these ideas? It functions like a proper seminar where everyone is given the readings in advance and has the opportunity to process them on their own. And then we come together and have guided conversations, sometimes in small groups or partners, sometimes as a collective. It is critically important that the class understands from the beginning that all of the work we're doing together is geared towards developing jointly authored policy proposals, which ultimately are presented to the district attorney, the commissioner of corrections, and other local elected officials. So there is a shared goal from the beginning, even if there is a divergence of views. And it would perhaps be surprising to someone on the outside to see how quickly people gel around the ideas that we're taking on. I mean, the people who are closest to the problems include people who go through the system and frontline prosecutors. So it's not as though we're throwing into a room together people who don't have anything in common. They just come at it from very different perspectives. And what reading together in a seminar format allows to happen is for the personal and emotional to be kind of channeled through a text in furtherance of a shared goal. And so the conversations will often start with, I agree with what John Pfaff says in chapter six, because here's my experience. But then very quickly, it turns into a conversation about what people know based on their own experience. And I think that it's important to note that the class is very much a college class. There is no, there have been no concessions made to the fact that some people have different educational backgrounds in the room. It's a very rigorous course because the inside students have the opportunity to receive college credits for their participation and the prosecutor students receive continuing legal education credits towards their maintenance of their bar membership. When we talk about these different perspectives, since you have this focus on producing policy proposals at the end, what what have some of those proposals uh, look like? Can we see their evidence of something that neither side, if I can put it that way, could have come up with on their own? Well, Jarrell can give a, an exa- a shining example of one that is very relevant right at this moment. Yeah, so um, the group that I broke up into um, featured two assistant district attorneys um, and one other incarcerated men. So it was four of us in the group. And one of the proposals that we came up with was to actually implement a computer lab with Internet access, not exactly Internet, but intranet, a restricted form of Internet service uh, for the incarcerated residents at Queensborough Correctional Facility. Um, and that policy was passed, and they actually like put computers, about 20 computers in Queensborough that had that Internet service. And the purpose of this proposal was set so that incarcerated men would have the opportunity to apply for vital documentation like a birth certificate, a Social Security card, um, and also reentry programs and services before they release from the prison. Um, and the problem is that, you know, most of the time people are bounced around throughout the incarceration from facility to facility and their property gets lost. And um, sometimes it's that fault of the administration. So if Queensboro is going to serve as a reentry facility, they should be the place where you apply for this. Thinking about the policy proposals, I'm particularly looking forward to the upcoming graduation in January of the current cohort of students because for the first time we have had a class in a women's facility in Upper Manhattan. And it has been interesting to see how there are 
different areas of interest amongst the women. The policy ideas that they're coming up with are um, often quite different and more tailored to women's population. And of course, that's a population in the criminal justice system that one, seems to be rising, and two, that does not get the same amount of attention as the male prison population. Jarrell, you, you mentioned you, you have this great TED Talk where you talk about your um, experience ex- experience in this Inside Criminal Justice program, and I'll, everybody should watch that. I'll, I'll link to it on the episode page for this. But in that TED Talk, you say there was a, a moment in, in one of the seminars where some of the uh, incarcerated students complained. They felt that the prosecutors maybe were tiptoeing too much around the I- issue of race. What was unique about the Queensboro course was that, you know, we had real deep and meaningful conversations. Um, and of course, you can't, as the student highlighted and paraphrasing him, you can't uh, read things like Michelle Alexander's book or John Fab's book, Locked In, um, without, you know, getting to the core of this problem, which is race um, and, and its social construction in America and how we reinforce it in different institutions. It's not, it doesn't just happen in the criminal justice system. It happens in the education system and other systems that, you know, have these kind of racial disparities in them as well. But I think that, you know, what was important about what he said was that it was a moment for us to dive deeper as a team. Um, when he raised those points about us, you know, tiptoeing around these things, these issues, that it was a point, it was a call to action for us, not just for the prosecutors, but us as incarcerated men. It was meaningful because at that point we actually began to have those more challenging conversations and people voiced their real sincere and deepest honest opinions about the system. I mean, and one of the things that was, was as Lucy mentioned, was that there was a, a disconnect in the level of education between incarcerated men and the district attorneys. The district attorneys weren't as informed on the, those people's experiences or what led to them committing those kind of acts. And us as, you know, people starting to get our, uh, for lack of better words, getting our feet wet in criminal justice reform, there were things that we did, just didn't know about what it takes to make policy and institutional and actual cultural change inside of agencies like this. So um, I did talk a lot, um, as I'm doing now, but mm. I, I did sit back and, and, and take a lot of notes, too. And, and I, Lucy can probably attest to this that I actually came to class with all of my notebooks one day from you know things that I've required over the years and different thoughts that I had in mind. But um, it was a phenomenal class. The meaningful part of it was us having those real raw conversations um, and g- getting completely off track and you know talking about. And, and even if we were venting, um, we just needed that space to vent, and it was good for the prosecutors to hear, and it was good for us to get it off our chest. Yeah, you told me you liked the class so much that you uh, you actually kept attending it after your release. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like? I mean, I was so committed. I was so from orientation. Like, I just knew that this was something that was going to be bigger than me. Um, and, I, and once we were actually in the class and they said what well, we would be developing policy recommendations, then I knew this was my chance to like prove to society, prove to my community, to my family that I can be more than what I am currently as an incarcerated man. I haven't completed much. I didn't get to complete high school on the outside. I had to go to Rikers Island and complete my general education diploma. Um, I wasn't able you to... You went meet. to Rikers when you were 17? 18. 18. Yeah. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of, you know, what I was given opportunities to do something right, I just wasn't able to complete them. And I said, you know, if this was, if I have the chance and opportunity to complete anything, I would want to complete this. And, uh, and I, will, I want my mom to be there um, on a completion day, which was our graduation ceremony that she was able to make. And for me, it didn't make a difference if I had to, you know, climb up a volcano to complete the program, I would have did it. Um, and that's how serious I was about it. It was amazing after our second class and Jarrell said, I'm getting out next week before the next class. Can I come back? And I said, well, I don't know. We hadn't planned on that scenario. I don't think that corrections is going to be down with it. But thankfully they were because they were so committed to the project. And then I still thought, well, who knows if he's really going to show. And lo and behold, I showed up at Queensboro and there was Jarrell in his street clothes waiting for us outside the facility. And so... Ten prosecutors, two professors, and Jarrell all in our street clothes walked into the facility together, and that was a really remarkable experience. And then, Jarrell, can you talk a little bit about what, what you're doing now? You're, you're running a program that's, I think, sort of similar to Inside Criminal Justice. You're also in college. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a sophomore at the School of General Studies at Columbia University, um, and I just had hope, as I had talked about in our graduation speeches, like we got to do something for people who are having those minor interactions with the justice system, who are at risk to being, um, you know, incarcerated for a long period of time, and particularly we got to focus on young people, not because I'm young myself, but because young people are known to have the most. You're fairly young. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and, and it's not because of my age, but it's more so behind the statistics and show that, you know, young people are more likely to have negative interactions with law enforcement. They're more likely to be stopped and frisked, and they're more likely to commit the most serious and violent crimes, particularly between the ages of 18 and 24. And I thought that was important for anything that I would um, hope to do if it be to focus on that population and people and because of my own personal experiences of being incarcerated at the age of 18. But I thought that, you know, young people offer a different critique of the system that's different from older men, which were most of the men in the, in the Queensboro course were older than me. But I wanted to take, you know, the same the same structure. I wanted to have 10 young people, 10 city officials for a seminar course, working across um, their own differences, going over some of these challenging readings. And I asked the young people when I recruited them from ATI programs and traditional high schools, I asked them would they be willing to come in on Saturdays and develop a curriculum with me. And I asked them to choose readings, choose a theme for each week, and to choose um, editorial um, articles that they would like to cover that would help inform and guide those discussions in the classroom. And I think the one thing that was just slightly different in, in the Justice Ambassadors Youth Council that's different from the inside criminal justice is that um, instead of just having all district attorneys, we try to expand it to different city agencies uh, so that they all have an opportunity because we know that, you know, sometimes these agencies and institutions work in silos. Um, so it's, it's things like that where we thought it was important to have not just district attorneys, but also people from the mayor's office, from city council, from the Department of Education, Administration of Child Services, Department of Homeless Services, which were some of the people who participated, but people in a position that can actually um, inform policy recommendations for their agency or who are in a position themselves to actually pass a policy. And we just graduated our second cohort. Um, and we're just hoping to have some of the successes as in- Inside Criminal Justice has. So, Lucy, what, well, you know, one thing I'm curious about is where does the funding come for this program? When we ran it out of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office as part of their legal training apparatus. My ultimate aspiration is that DA's offices will undertake this and incorporate it into their legal training as a new way of encouraging their prosecutors to think about their work. I think that the ideal way to do that is to form a partnership with a local university or community college. That being the model, it's not an expensive operation. It basically is printing educational materials, which can be done in-house and then going out to the facility after hours. That said, as we look to scale it and create replication materials, I am definitely looking for funding on the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution side so that we can help get the message out and provide adequate supports to other offices nationwide who are undertaking this model for legal education. So if you have anyone in mind, send them my way. Well, I have the government in (laughs) mind, I guess. I mean, it it seems like we know that education, it works. So it just seems like there is is an opportunity there for more public investment in, in this kind of work taking place behind bars. I mean, we also know that every money, every dollar you spend on education behind bars uh, saves more than that dollar in, in other areas. And imagine that in this case, unlike college behind bars in general, you have the added dividends of an improved relationship between traditionally adversarial parties. And I think like just to, you know, really hone in on a point of, of um, higher education and this significance towards, you know, rehabilitation and only thing I really see that would rehabilitate somebody in prison. But I think, you know, higher education and like we really just got to drive home the fact that this is giving people hope. This is pe- giving people desires and aspirations in life that they otherwise might not have had. It's giving me something that's worth me living for. And I think that, you know, education for me is like, it's more than me just, you know, giving a TED Talk. It's more than me having an opportunity to work and do things that I've been a, a privileged to be a part of in New York City. It's more than the work. It's actually giving me something that I can have and that nobody else can take away from me. And employment opportunities, people can take away from me. You can't take away what I've learned and what I've acquired over time and that I've worked hard to achieve. And I think that, you know, from my conditions that I grew up in my neighborhood, there wasn't anything that was worthwhile. It was a cloud of hopelessness and despair over my community. And education has been that thing that's been my shining light in my corner. And even though I don't possess a degree at the time, as a student, that's what drives me to finish out uh, my higher education. Because I know that this is something that, you know, I've, I've known, I've worked hard for. And it's something that I know can't be taken away from me. And I know that I've grew up and things have been taken away and I felt like I've been cast out of society long before I was even sent to prison. I just didn't feel like I had opportunities or resources to be more than an underprivileged, under-resourced, a minority person in America. So I think, you know, obtaining that college degree for me is the only way that I see myself sustained in a healthy and successful adult life. 
That was my conversation with Jarrell Daniels and Lucy Lang. Lucy is the executive director at the Institute for Innovation in Prosecution. Jarrell is a sophomore at Columbia University School of General Studies and the program manager of the Justice Ambassadors Youth Council at Columbia University Center for Justice. For more information about what you heard in today's episode, click the link in your show notes or visit courtinnovation.org slash newthinking. For their help with this episode, my thanks to Shanna K. Salmon and Julius Lang. Today's show was edited and produced by me with technical support from the unswervable Bill Harkins. Samiha Mia is our Director of Design. Emma Dayton is our Vice President of Outreach. Our theme music is by Michael Aaron at QuiverNYC.com. And our show's founder is Rob Wolf. This has been New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Thanks for listening.